thumbs up. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, that was a ton of fun. Great song selection, Ken. Um, Shannon, that reminded us of, or me of our trip. It was good to see Max there too. A little dance off. Um, so it's great to have you all. Um, my name is Jennifer Hunt. I'm Chief Intelligence Officer with the Real Estate Wealth Lab. And we are at our research lab today. And I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> buckle up. There is a lot of data. So um, I know that this is going to feel probably a little overwhelming. There's so much information in here today. But what I'm hoping that you're going to get from it is a couple of uh, nuggets where you can relax and calm down because it's pretty like fiery out there in terms of headlines and craziness. Um, and also you're gonna have the data points. So just remember that I'm not gonna necessarily cover each and every single slide because I want you to have the data if it's real relevant to you. So that we're not taking up this entire time going through each and every single you know data point or whatever have you, but um, that you'll at least have it for reference if you need it or as a real estate investor or realtor or professional. So, um, yeah, so it's great to see you. So many of you with your um, your video on. So Patrick and Victoria, good to see you. That's my dad. And Terry and Daryl, great to see you too. And Doug, you're always the first one on. Graham, great to see you. Nima, I see that you don't have your uh, video on and that's okay. And Catherine, it's all right. I've seen you recently and you've got a great tan in Mexico. Hugh, looking good. Let's rock on. <laughs> okay, let's get going. It's great to see you guys. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's uh, share my screen. And we are at the research lab. Who here, yeah, from Cabo San Lucas, that's awesome. Um, who here has considered um, investing in Cincinnati or anywhere in Ohio or in Tampa? Pop it in the chat, anyone, or just wave if you have nobody yet. Okay, there's a big, huge ton of folks out there who are considering um, investing in Ohio. And I know there's lots of different organizations that are looking at Ohio, and there are some markets that work well. Um, and I did some comparison. So anyways, I won't get into it because we've got a lot <clears throat> to go through and we are gonna go through that today um, in depth. So uh, a huge welcome to everybody. The Real Estate Wealth Lab, as you know, we're here for you uh, for all your research and education needs, whether you're just getting started in real estate or you're going next level. You'll notice, excuse me, <clears throat> you'll notice that we've got our legal disclaimer. This is that sometimes we express opinions. <laughs> sometimes those opinions are pretty uh, formidable, if you will. Um, and we do provide forward-looking information and we have all these expectations and beliefs, et cetera. Um, but this is a disclaimer. You really need to just check in on them. And you'll also start to notice, I haven't got them in here today entirely, but I want to point something out because we've been using like a buy signal or hold signal or a void signal. I just want you to know, oh, Julius, you're in, you're active in Ohio. Okay, cool. That'll be great for you. Um, so when we talk about these signals, they're signals, they're independent, they're not, you have to take them all in and put them all together in terms of the real estate cycle formula, in terms of measuring them and ranking them. So for example, like if we say GDP is a buy signal, on a particular location. That doesn't mean that you should go out and buy it. It means that it is a signal that would indicate a great possibility of buying it. Um, and you'll just wanna do your diligence there. And then when you start to see, oh, that's a buy signal, that's a buy signal, and they all start to add up, then that makes good sense. But if you see like a couple holds, a couple sells, so I hope that that makes sense, but you're gonna see more and more of that. So I wanted to just introduce to you um, the, the, the thought process behind it. As always for the chat rules, please just, engage, pop it in the chat. I'll try to answer questions as we go. Um, this is a great community. So I know we are all respectful, courteous, and kind, especially because I know all, so many of you individually as well. Uh, so please don't solicit or sell. So again, thank you for being here. Um, this is being recorded and it will be available in your member portal and it may be um, available elsewhere also. So Okay, I should probably start my timer because um, <laughs> this is a big one. All right, so um, let's see. One moment, pardon me, guys. Okay, all right. So we are going to spend a little bit of time on the macroeconomics for US and Canada and what they mean to real estate investors as always. And then uh, Cincinnati, Ohio market analysis and Tampa, Florida. 
So um, it was very interesting, very interesting. These are your uh, next live dates for um, our live digital events. Uh, so August 10th, August 17th, you're here right now on July 27th and August 31st for the next research lab. Um, for the market leaders lab, we actually have I'm really delighted. We've got um, uh, a, a, an incredible, I mean, she is a mogul in real estate. I mean, this is, she's absolutely outstanding. Um, I've been working with her since I think 2009. So whatever that is, like 13 years or 14 years, I've known her, or whatever, a very long time. She's absolutely incredible. Her name is Carmen Campanero from ProFunds. Um, and I highly recommend you come out to that. It's definitely August 10th on our radars. So um, we're gonna get right into it. Here's the research lab. As you, many of you know, the real estate cycle is simply the business cycle of real estate. It has different periods of stabilization, expansion and contraction. And it can, it can have a different duration of each. And that's one of the things I'm very proud about with our real estate cycle formula is that we're actually more able to um, identify the duration and more accurately identify the duration of a particular cycle. So how long is that, you know, stabilization going to last, etc. And what we're doing and going into, oh, thanks um, for popping that in the chat. Exactly. You can register um, very easily. And of course, for members, you're already pre-registered. So just make sure you mark it on your calendar. And then we get, we get the real estate cycle formula. You can see like there's all these indicators. There's about actually 30 now, 31. <laughs> There's about 31 um, indicators that we look at and they're, they might go up, they might go down, and then they have a weighted impact and um, it's not in this order. So jo jo GDP, jobs and people, it might not be. And that's what we've seen in Florida as a perfect example is that more people went there first and then created jobs and then created GDP. So you, it, it really depends. You want to be watching these and that's what we do for you. And then that typically those leading indicators of so there's several of them that they'll um, push the property, sorry, the rental market about uh, whether up or down about one year out from that initial kind of maybe catalytic catalyst event. And then the property market is about two years, but like I typically that's on a typical thing, but then politics can come in and movement of people can come in and really shift that and change that. And we can forecast with relative accuracy, whether something's going to be a six month, cycle or a seven year to 10 years. So that's what we're gonna be doing. And this is where we are right now. Uh, so here's here's your conclusion. If you see no more, um, we are expecting a softening in the market for two from now through, it's right on schedule, 2022, about this time, um, two, which is two years after the GDP drop in um, um, April, 2020. So about that time frame, And it is gonna be a softening for through to 2024. But it's a softening. All of the other fundamentals are really at the moment, they're still very like they're strong, they're modest, they're moving in the right direction. Now we do have some interesting things at play and you probably have seen them in the news, like inflation and recession and interest rates. So those can come in and either change this cycle at any time. So this is where we're constantly monitoring it. And um, you know I'm passionate about uh, identifying fake news. I'm also identifying, uh, 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 wanting to know and, and share for you. I'm super passionate about it. The, the, the news, the stories, the studies, and unpacking them for real estate investors so that we can make smarter choices and inform our clients so that they can also, you know, if you've got, for example, um, Shannon, you're a realtor, so you can help uh, your clients out there as well and be better informed. So I love this. We've got the butterfly effect happening here. <laughs> okay, so we're going to get into GDP for both Canada and the U.S. Um, here's our latest and greatest. So you'll notice we're building. So we've got the, at the top, it's May, then June, and in July, I want you to be able to see the changes and see the trends of what's going on. So what do you see? Okay, that revised down again, you can see that in May, Canada was 4.2 US 3.8, and then revised down in June and then revised down further in July. But what I want you to really like, because it's, it's pretty scary out there, like, oh my gosh, it's revised down. It's, it's worse than expected. But at the moment, it's still showing positive GDP growth. And that is very, very, very important. And it, the delta, the net is still stronger. Like it's, it's all recovered from pre-pandemic from 2020 negatives. So th this is actually very positive news. It's 
definitely hold signals, a little bit of buy signals, but always, of course, making sure that your property is cash flow positively, et cetera. Um, and then we're going to talk about de definition of recession. And I know I brought this up the last time, but it's worth repeating because um, <clears throat> I think they might change the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> so the dictionary version of a recession, this is like the noun, is a temporary economic decline during which trade and industrial activity are reduced, generally identified by a fall in GDP in two successive quarters. Now listen, I've never thought that two successive quarters is worth even mentioning in terms of a, a recession. So I never agreed with this definition per se, but this was the definition and is the definition. Now, of course, the order of magnitude, does it go longer than two successive quarters, et cetera, all these things. But that's the official statement. And so I'm going to come back to that in just a minute, because that's where we need to be landing. All right. So then global news, majority of Canadians think countries in recession, new polls show. So 80% of Canadians believe that prices are going to keep going up and that 59% think that we're in an economic recession. Okay, we, um, I, I get it. And we want to be mindful of what we're hearing out there and then what is the truth. Um, and I'm not suggesting that we're not potentially going into a recession because there's a lot of indicators like the fact that we have inflation and I'll talk about that later that we will be going into recession. That's a, it's a byproduct of inflation. But fear can also exacerbate it. And so we've got these like headlines, fear, economists saying it, here it comes, recession, et cetera. And if we get this parrot effect, it will also be a little bit like that butterfly effect and actually materialize. So we wanna be mindful of our language. And then Canada and, and the US too, actually, there's so many other indicators that are buoying this, this, this economy. So for example, like unemployment in both the US and Canada are at record lows and their labor like the labor and the participation rates are actually above pre-pandemic like we're we're like humming but i'll show you some stats when we get there so just again we've got to be weighing all of this together um cbc canada's job market is setting records so why are people talking about a recession exactly canada's unemployment rate record low canada is in better than um in any shape or form than the g in the g7 so we want to keep keep calm and read this post and start to make sure that we're we're really paying attention to is it really a recession what does it look like yes maybe it's on the brink of it but we do have like there's there's just not a lot of this joblessness we've got lots of jobs um so i've got a lot of data in there you want to be critical and that's really just staying away from the fray of of fear until we actually see all of the data showing that way. So remember, I just showed you GDP and I'm gonna show you jobs in a moment um, and they're both very strong. So, in that, you know, they're, they're pretty strong. They're, they're better than they, they could be, that's for sure. Okay, so JP Morgan, their economic, their July economic and market insights, uh, just, it was a great, great read. It's in your um, real estate wealth news that came out probably today or it was last week's, it might have been last week's. But here's what a little quote that I wanted to share from them, because everyone's got their own opinion. JP Morgan obviously has a big stake in this game. Um, they are saying to them that the tight labor markets limit the risk of near-term recession, so in, in their view. Um, but it also limits the potential for inflation to come down over the immediate term. Inflation is here for a lot longer. We've been talking about that, so we expect that. So in other words, there's a lot of opinions out there that are, are they, they see that it's not quite recession time, but um, these are all sort of signals that we need to be watching very, very closely right now, because there's just a, can I use the word cacophony of stuff out there? Like it is noisy and we want to break through that. Um, Business Insider, this was, <laughs> this was great. Uh, Dwayne, if you're on, this is for you, man. Thanks for being a stringer and sending this my way. And the next one too, I'm gonna to laugh. So here's where we're going with this. So I gave you the definition of re recession and in the Business Insider, uh, it's the headline, no, the White House isn't changing the definition of a recession. 
All right. So there's there's actually a whole thing going on out in the news right now that the the U.S. government is changing this, uh, the definition of a downturn, and um, there you know it, it can't be right, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And I'm all for like reevaluating what's right and what's wrong. But this is this is this is fascinating. So on the White House blog, yes, I have never been to the White House blog. Have you guys? So on the White House blog, it actually talks about how economists actually determine whether the economy is, is, is in a recession or not. And the way that they actually do it versus the recession definition, they aren't the same. So there was a mix match all along, or is this spin? Regardless, they look, they, apparently the White House says that they define a recession differently in the dictionary. Um, a significant decline in economic activity that is spread across the economy and that lasts more than a few months. Okay, well, we'll see. So in other words, this is a, a nebulous sort of concept in terms of what that is, but here's what we need to be mindful of. Again, is it to be or not to be? There's a super tight labor market. We're going to talk about jobs in just a second. There's improved labor supply. There's pent up consumer demand that is expected to keep the economy going. Now, interest rates rising may kind of offset a little bit. We're having our emotions, they absolutely, they absolutely matter, that market confidence. And so the jury is out. It is still too early. There is a lot of positive news on buoying that economy but it is too early. So again, as I've been saying, I think this slide's been around for a long time. I'll just remind everyone that why a recession is because just like all things set aside is that the government's printed and circulated money while the economy was not doing as so well. It was a little bit of what I call the life jacket, life jacket economy. And it's going to deflate, it has to because it can't continue to be buoyed up. And so that's what we're expecting. We expect a deflation, not a burst. And again, the economy and jobs is only one indicator of the 30 plus that we look at for real estate markets. So if there's dozens of other indicators that are showing this long-term modest expansionary period for real estate, including things like supply, construction starts, demand, those types of things. So that's why we're, we're, we look into it really deeply. And then when it comes to inflation, um, as I mentioned before, that real estate is typically one of the most stable assets during actually both turbulent times, which uh, who here thinks that we've got some crises still going on here, a little turbulence out there. Yeah, great. Well, Jen, I agree with you. And um, I've been using the teacups for sure to manifest a way better world. So thank you for sending those to me out here. I love them. They're beautiful. So um, yeah, during turbulent times and during inflationary times, real estate is one of the most stable assets. And unlike stocks, real estate actually goes up with or outpaces inflation in terms of appreciates, whereas stocks typically are something that in inflationary times don't do as well to start. To start. I'm not saying that you can't do well in them, and please invest wherever you want to, but real estate typically does this and it stays, and so you're always ahead of the game of the, of the inflation game, if you will. So we map up our GDPs and, you know, they're still moving along upwards and there's not they're not down yet and yes if you look at the quarter over quarter data for uh, the U.S. for last quarter it was down but again we're not all the way there yet so we're going to be watching that again so jobs uh here's your jobs summary for Canada and um in May we had 39,000 basically 40,000 in June we were down 43,000 so basically kind of a, a net uh, well, gain and loss. So that's not very good. But unemployment is improving. Another record low, June is 4.9. Participation rate is hardly changed at all. 64.9% participation rate. Wages are up um, month over month, 3.9%. And year over year, 5.2%. So that's all pretty, like other than jobs for that one month, um, again, one month does not make a trend. We've been going uh, trending up on the job scheme very, very well in terms of recovery. So we'll be watching that again. But this is not like, this isn't recessionary yet. Um, similarly for the US, May was up 400,000 jobs. June up, well, I should put a plus there. June was up 372,000 jobs. So like, that's very, very good. Unemployment is 3.6%, which, an, like, which is the same as last month. So it's had a historical low for unemployment rates, 
for at least two months and if not declining the whole time and long-term unemployed I was declining and I just wrote it right there exactly so a couple of stats here to look at I just wanted you to have them available and most of these are positive signs for jobs but not so good for GDP. So if GDP is kind of like not doing such a great thing and jobs are up, what does that tell you about productivity? So maybe we're not as productive, we're not doing as good of a job, I don't know. Maybe people need to have some more key performance indicators, but we wanna be watching our productivity as well. And then you can see the productivity is actually down in the US um, for the first quarter of 2022. So in other words, we might be having more jobs, but that we still need the economic output from those jobs in order to help buoy up our actual economy. Oh, I know that got deep. So thank you for staying with it. Okay. Um, so jobs though, are generally on the upward trajectory. See, it's like you take out all the, the emotion and all of the crazy headlines. And when you start plotting it, it doesn't look that, that bad at this time so people um and again people are such an important component of our leading indicators when it comes to forecasting real estate markets so um the u.s is showing some cities that lost population we want to be looking at domestic migration where in other words and we've done this a lot <clears throat> oh the productivity reduction is massive yeah but that was a seven percent loss in productivity that they're accounting for so it's very interesting um, when it comes to people, we want to be watching where people are going and where they're coming from and all of these things. And we still want to be mindful of these demographic shifts. So I'm reminding you of all the things, the great migration, the great resignation, the great reshuffle, the great refuge. Remember when I was talking about Florida, people are moving there because of how politically free it is, um, given current uh, politics and policies elsewhere. So, and then why? people are moving for affordability. They've got the flexibility. The sun and palm trees are still there. Politics, economic opportunities, etc. cetera. Um, and so we just want to be mindful of where those folks are going. And there's uh, a lot of data about that. Um, and Canadian and US populations are rising. Mm, there's still an, a, a lot of opportunity, and I, I don't think it's in here, but there's still a lot of opportunity for Canadian um, and US, I guess, uh, immigration to actually fully open the borders for, for individuals to come in. It's still a little bit light. In other words, what I mean is the 2021 um, data for immigration was primarily change of resident status as opposed to actually newcomers coming in. And that we're still seeing that uh, trend a little bit right now. So we actually need the individuals to come into Canada and that one is definitely in your, uh, and the US in order to help buoy it up, uh, not just theoretically, there you go. <laughs> but if, of course the change of status is also helpful because then people can actually get to work. So it's not, it's definitely helpful from an economic standpoint, but it doesn't add in that uh, extra um, that extra layer of demand on your rents and your properties. So the Scotiabank forecast tables for our interest rates. Who here has seen uh, the latest and greatest about interest rates? <laughs> yeah, you, right? Uh, and I know all of you have been watching this, but just to see the trend. And again, we've been talking about it. Expect that that Daft Punk song higher, stronger, faster, harder, you name it, like it just, that is what we're expecting for interest rates. And I'm going to scare you in a little bit, minute, I think. Um, <laughs> I'm going to scare you and then we're going to back off. So just hang on with me for a second. So um, June, that like I like this because it shows also what they were forecasting just a month ago um, for 22 forecast at 3% 3 per, 3 overall. Um, but now it's 3.5 and 3.25. And then look at what's the change of forecast for 2023 also at 3.5. So um, it's interesting. I think that they're going to go higher than this, but um, that's what they're forecasting at Scotia Bank right now. Um, the Bank of Canada increases the policy. Oh, yeah, this was a humdinger. It is, <clears throat> okay, this one and the ne next one, it's, I get to it in a moment. It is in your newsletter. I do recommend that you read the, the monetary policy <laughs> report. It's pretty epic, or at least just a summary. And don't worry, I'll give you a summary now, but it might be worth the read. <laughs> Anyways, so the Bank of Canada increases the policy interest rates by 100 basis points. We saw that July 13th, and they're continuing that quantitative tightening. 
um, we so the deposit the bank rate is now at two point seven five percent. Okay. Oh, and the overnight rate, pardon me, is to 2.5%. So here it is, you have it in the table, you can see how much they've gone up. I want you to have this data so that you always have it as reference. So as of July, they're up, July 13th. Um, similarly, <clears throat> excuse me, for the US interest rates, 2022, June, this was, so the June data, um, and it went up previously, so it's actual 1.75. And then in uh, by July, so this month, it's the same. It hasn't gone up yet, um, but there is uh, expectations that they will. So another, this is in next, what was it? Next, next advisor. Today's mortgage rate, uh, right, mortgage and refinance rates. And so again, when they set the bank rate, it doesn't necessarily mean that the banks follow what that is. They typically do, but sometimes they don't. So for example, I remember one dark day in, in 20, it would have been 2016 or 2015 or something like that. And the bank rate went down and the banks were like, yeah, so what? We want to make a, we want to make a profit. We're not giving you any discounts on your mortgages or your interest rates or whatever. And I thought that was absolutely just wild. Um, and the, the converse can work too. The bank rate can come down and the, uh, you remember that too, Julius? Yeah, I was really pissed. <clears throat> I got to say that. So at any rate, but the same can work here too. So that the banks are like, their bank rate, okay, it's gone up, but they're like, mm, you know what? No, we're not going to actually raise our mortgage rates. So this is happening. Um, it also happens in the spring, summer, typically, because they've got quotas to meet. So don't expect this to last, but at any rate, they be in the banks. So here you have it. This is where in the U.S., the May uh, data so that you can see what you could, you know, what, what's going on out there for a 30 year fix right down to the arms and things like this. And this is where it is in June. So you can see some of them have gone up, some of them have gone down and uh, you can shop around. Inflation. Uh, again, getting these data for you so that you always have it. And you're being able to see and feel the trends because you're it, it will make a difference in, in your real estate life for sure. So inflation rate last um, 8.6 was this was May, uh, and CPI for June for the US was 9.1. So you can see that it's continuously going up. Remember, they said it was transitory. Remember, in January, they said inflation would disappear by the end of December 2022. And remember that if you've been hanging out with me and hanging out with this amazing team at Rule, you'd know that all of that was a load of hooey from the moment I opened my mouth in September last year. So at any rate, um, in Canada, same thing, May, 2022. Um, oh yeah, right, no, Jen, we do not want what they are smoking. <laughs> we'll be smarter than that for sure. And we are, so it's awesome. <clears throat> so May, 2022, um, so it was previously it was 6.8 now 7.7 .7 in may and now 8.1 in canada for june so it's going up this is an awesome article by stansbury research like really good highly recommend you've got it in your newsletters um it's in the in the, the rural intelligence newsletter it's the 1970s all over again and um yes they they accurately say you know what's going on in terms of inflation that's going up, rising interest rates, uh, social unrest, global oil supply caused by the war, not by supply chain disruptions, not by all these other things. Um, and it's looking like the 1970s. And then they talk a lot about money supply and inflation. And it's, it's, it's very cool because we have had, we have had money supply, the like quantitative easing at high, high levels in the past. But it was not circulated to the people during a time where the economy was not functioning like fully. And as a result, it didn't have this kind of damage. So we've been able to kind of stay out of the fray here for quite some time. But right now, we've got money supply just circulating, like just virulently in there. And as a result, inflation is going up. So is Mark on today? Is Mark Ambient on here? I don't know. Okay, well, Nick, I see you. So make sure, go and tell Mark that this is for him, okay? This whole video, <laughs> because at our last research lab, Mark was asking about, um, about inflation. And I know all of you are too, but inflation and how long is it gonna go for and how much is it gonna get to? So I've answered the how long it's gonna go for. 
this talks about what is it really? And I kind of like didn't get into a full on answer, but I'm going to tell you what this is. So watch for this video, it's coming soon. But because you asked, I did a case study. And um, this is the case study of the, the coat hangers. <laughs> so I needed coat hangers for my vacation rentals in uh, the US, these are US dollars. And, oh yes, so in September, 2021, I had to go out and buy these for the vacation rental. And they were 14.5 cents per coat hanger. I didn't get enough. So I had to go back 33 days later and they'd gone up 27%. Now we knew that inflation was gonna happen in September, 2021. We knew it because it was right on schedule. It's a lagging indicator. It's also a leading indicator. So it's right on schedule. We knew that that was gonna happen, but we saw it immediately. And then I just checked um, July 11th, they're now 19.1 cents. So we've experienced in nine months, a 31% increase on um, your coat hangers. Now, that's not the CPI, is it? Guess what they don't include in the CPI index? Oh, the shit that you need at home. So like the real stuff that you're using and that you would experience in your budget. So I encourage you, forget CPI, it's really like inflation is closer to like 30% and yeah, it varies, but you get the idea. This is just a little sample on coat hangers. Um, and I do, I, I actually recommend that you try this at home and pick any old you know, household item, check it out. You've been to the grocery store, you know what it is and get some street cred and go, okay, you know what? I know that they're talking about CPI, but this is what we're actually feeling. And guess what? What we actually see in our wallets is what is important to me because that's called cash flow management and uh, that's important. So now I've got another little talk here and I'm not going to go into it, but I'm going to really focus because I'm going to try and um, get into this, I think, for our market leaders a little bit. Um, so there's three ways to cure inflation. I've talked about them a lot. One is to stop printing government money and stop circulating it. Two is to raise interest rates. But what you probably didn't know is that I haven't really talked about it at this level yet, is that typically in order for the interest rate hikes, they've got to be substantial in order to like match inflation. So if inflation is quote unquote 9% or whatever, but actually like feeling like 30%, I'm not suggesting that we go there. In the interest rates can't be like, oh, 1% increase is gonna combat a 9% inflation rate. Like I don't play video games, but it's like, here's little baby without any arms. And <laughs> like in terms of, you know, weapons in the video game. And this thing is like, you know, the biggest monster ever. you got to have the matching in that level. So, and in fact, you need to have your interest rate about one or two points higher than the inflation rate. So if inflation rate is at nine, your interest rates should theoretically be at 11%. Oh shit, nobody wants that. That's, that's a big deal, but that's what it would take in order to actually have an impact on inflation. And then even then, if that were to happen, none of this would even be impacted for another one and a half years because the interest rates or and stop reimprinting money would actually take one and a half years to have inflation even come down. So we'd have to go to like 11%. And I'm not suggesting we do, there's other factors, but especially when we start thinking about impacts on mortgages, um, I'd love to hear it in the chat. Has anyone had an experience of their mortgages going up? I was just talking with a friend and please just, you know, yes or no, you, you, you have Hugh, okay. Yeah. Um, and. And I'm also curious, like order of magnitude, has it been pretty big? How's it going? Are you, how are you feeling? No? Yeah, okay, Doug, all right, thanks, appreciate it. So a friend of mine and I were talking um, and it's, so thank you, that's you, that's what I wanted. To, I wanted someone to answer that because Okay, so it's been about 500 a month increase. And I was just talking with someone um, uh, this week and in the last nine months, their interest rates and their mortgages have gone from a $2,000 a month payment to a $2,800 a month payment. And, and the words were really interesting and I will unpack them at a later date. But the words were, you know, I'd rather take inflation on gas prices or on the fact that my dollar isn't worth as much when I go to buy groceries because I can at least influence that I can eat less or I can drive less or I can do other things to mitigate that 
but I can't do anything about my mortgage. So that's another reason why we're going to be having pro funds at our market leaders lab uh, in, in a couple of weeks, like, cause these, all these things. And remember again, GDP is 20, or sorry, Canada's GDP is comprised of 20% of it is the housing and property market, real estate. So if we, we like, if we were to go to 11% and it's only gone up a little bit at 800, people, there would be foreclosures all over the place. It just wouldn't be sustainable. So there's going to have to be some give and take or something very different um, in order to resolve this. Oh, and that brings me to point number two and a half, which is innovation. Innovation is the number one way to get out of inflation, innovate out of it. So I think that that's where we're going to be likely going. Again, I'm just reminding you, August 10th, um, we're going to be having Carmen Campanero from Pro Funds Mortgage on, and I'm delighted to go through this and figure out what we need to do for mortgages. So it'll be awesome. She's great. So then this was a report. This is the Bank of Canada Monetary Policy Report from July. Comes out twice a year. And this thing, it's a bad boy, man. But uh, I'll give you the, <laughs> give you the Coles notes because um, I'm sure you don't want to read it. But uh, so basically, the Bank of Canada Monetary Policy Report says that uh, excess demand and inflation is broadening and it's high. It's higher than expected. All right. Um, and that they're ex the Bank of Canada is projecting inflation to decline by the end of 2023 and return to 2% target by end of 2024. I am curious to know how that will work. Quote unquote, inflation is in Canada is higher and more persistent than the bank of Can uh, than the bank expected in its April monetary policy report. So let me get that straight. In April, they put out a monetary policy report. So I guess this is quarterly. And in July, it's still higher than what they were expecting then. So what are we seeing? You need to take everything, no offense, love you Canada, but you need to take everything with major, major grains of salt. Because the Bank of Canada, again, is attributing inflation to higher prices passed on by businesses. And we've been through this enough to know that inflation is not that is just isn't it. Inflation is the devaluation of a currency. It's brought on only by a monetary policy of printing too much money during a downturn in the economy. That's it. So this, yeah, thanks, Hugh. Nonsense. <laughs> grain of salt. And um, actually, I recommend you take it with such a grain of salt that uh, it's like this. Have you ever been to a salt flat? I've actually been to a salt flat and harvested salt, by the way, in the British Virgin Islands. Shannon, I'm not sure if you were there with me on that one. Um, but uh, yeah, this is this is the amount of salt that we're thinking of right now when we see that. And let's also just get real. Um, who's to blame for inflation? It's comp complicated. Is it though? No, it's not. And if you need and want more information, you can get it. Um, it's in a, it's in our uh, member portal. Um, and uh, from January that goes through a really, really detailed um, outline of, of inflation. And then this video, it's in your um, real estate wealth lab intelligence newsletter from last week. I highly recommend you watch it. It's quite short. It's about five minutes. It's not mine. Um, I don't know the professor, but it was really well done. And it gives you a really good sense. Like if you're trying to explain this to a client or how it can get um, resolved, it is, it's very good. Um, and they talk about um, money losing value. So I agree with that. And then the two types of inflation, monetary and non-monetary, and it describes that. And what it really boils down to is understanding that in order to combat inflation, it does mean that you have to be a very, 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 very out of the box leader and be willing to accept responsibility for some of this. And it's, it, it's very difficult to take accountability for it, especially when I, that just doesn't work. So the answer is we know how we got here. Or of course we could just change, we being the governments could just change the definition of the recession anyways, and then it won't exist. So um, we, we're in this for the long haul. We are expecting inflation to continue. We will experience some form of recession, but it, there's so many other fundamentals that are up, uh, putting upper pressure on real estate that it probably will be a longer term of like with a little softening now for a couple of years, but 
a long-term upward trend. There, again, that silver lining for investors is when it comes to inflation, again, real estate typically outpaces or um, at least goes in line with and appreciates in line with uh, inflation, but it even outpaces it. So again, here's, oh, there's that link. So if you wanna check it out, highly recommend it. You can even, um, the team's done a great job in the member back, uh, in the in the member portal, pardon me. And in the member portal, there's like actually uh, in the video, there's a little section and you can go, oh, I just wanna watch the inflation part. Oh, I just wanna watch this part. So it's super, super fast. And some pretty creative naming conventions in there too. It's really fun. Um, okay. Also coming soon is inflation modeling. So how does this actually like work in your real estate? Um, what does it do to your expenses? What does it do to your, uh, um, where, where they apply if you've got rent controls? Oh yeah, I remember those are legs and they're based on CPI. So your coat hangers went up 30%, uh, your CPI is at 9%, your rent control, it ain't gonna make 9%. They scrub that even more for your rent control. So that'll be probably at six. Cool story, bro. All right, so we're gonna model that out for you. And it's gonna look something like this. Um, I am not diving into this deeply today, but just know that it's being worked on in the, in, the, in the background for you. So you can actually feel and get a sense of what that will do for your portfolio. And again, with these crises, with debt, with money uh, being printed and debt, you are going to get in inflation and we are gonna have higher interest rates. So again, just take a picture of this quote card, real estate and inflation typically work hand in hand and they do all right together. Okay, rental market. So I'm just gonna go through the data really quickly here. Got, I'm doing okay on time, kind of pounding through it here. Um, so June, 2022 rent reports since 2020, they've been trending up. Um, April, 2022 up 9% year over year and May, 2022 up 10.5% year over year. Why? Because rent is responding to the leading indicators from one year ago. And one year ago in around like June-ish uh, 2021, we started seeing the economy recover and jobs recover and it started to boost up. And so as a result, a year later, this is exactly on track and as expected, um, responding to last year's leading indicators. Um, you can see at the top here, we've got a little bit May versus June. So the May is the one behind, so over here on the left. And then the June rankings are on the right. Um, so Vancouver, Toronto are still neck and neck. Um, uh, Burlington and Burnaby keep kind of swapping for that third spot. Um, Oakville's at the four. Uh, this is just for Canada. We've got US in a sec. Um, and Etobicoke is in there too. So um, those are the, the top spots for the highest rent. But also interesting, what you want to be looking at when you're looking at the rent data also is the month over month. Because um, that can give you... That can give you practical, like as a real estate investor, if you're in that city, it's like, oh, do I need to do something? Do I need to market a little bit differently? Do I need to respond to that? Or do I need to just watch the trend? But it's a little trigger that if you see the month over month doing something fun, like 6.9% month over month in Burnaby, hmm, very cool. I may or may not have real estate in Burnaby. Yeah, right on. I do. Okay. Um, so then same thing for the US. They're monthly report and uh this is from iProperty and um I guess the stats didn't make it in there but at any rate here you are I'll give you the the Coles notes the national average rent increased 20 percent year over year and still the highest spike on record so the same thing is going on in the U.S. and we're seeing that rents are still on the rise and again rents are lagging indicators so they're responding to stuff that happened from last year and since We've had continual improvements in recovery, economic recovery, uh, population growth to a certain extent, um, jobs have been breaking records. So we should therefore see rents stabilize slightly in this next like year, year and a half, but that we should expect them to rise for the foreseeable future. Um, and you do wanna make sure that you're looking at the data for your specific market. So when it comes to the property market, um, Canada's housing market is cooling as rates rise, but rents have never been hotter. Now this is like getting, it's kind of getting me angry, <laughs> but I don't get angry, I'm over it. But it's just, it's, I find it so fascinating that, you know, all these folks are saying, you know, the, rent, the, the interest rates are causing the market to cool. 
you guys know better, you're smarter, you know that there's like at least 30 indicators that are moving the market. So one interest rate increase is not the course of what's going on here. What's cooling the damn market is the real estate cycle formula. If 2020, what happened? GDP, massive job losses, no people, no immigration. So guess what? We have to expect it now. These rent, like we're going to see rents, we're going to see property prices cool. Sorry, property prices cool right now, and that and that we're definitely that's where we're at. So um, you're also going to see um, so sales. Um, they're a little bit down, but again, these are like super broad strokes. It really depends on where you are. Um, and that's, and, and the, there are, there's a lot of news out here on risk of foreclosures, like this whole report. <sighs> it's, it's my opic. We really do need to look at a bigger picture. Yes, there is definitely, of course, risk of foreclosures, but there's also, I think it's like that Canada, or I don't know if I'm talking about Canada right now is like at the um, the lowest, yeah, re risk of increased defaults remains low in Canada. Like it's not, it's not matching what the headlines are saying out there. It's like, oh, it's going to be a crash and people can't pay it, etc. There's still, there's still lots of room. So we'll be, we'll be watching it closely. Um, so again, you're going to hear all of these news, news items and stories of cooling off is not a crash. And just remember that those, all those other indicators are, are, under the surface, and there's a lot to talk about them. So June market, um, we're seeing this is in the US. So prices are still up double digits year over year. They're selling fast. Their day, like days on market are going down and active listings are going up. So more is coming on the market, which is good, um, but it's still not enough to actually satisfy the supply demand uh, situation. In other words, there's a lack of supply and still reasonable demand. There's still actually quite a bit of demand, um, but it might it might soften, of course, as interest rates go up. Sure, but there's all these other factors, like as immigrants come in, etc., that's improving um, that or is putting upward pressure on demand, and also construction's down because it's so expensive. And like, remember, I think last time I mentioned like windows in Vancouver just went up 40%. <laughs> oh my God. And I had to get a window repaired. Wow. $14,000 was the quote for one window. Like, and it's not even a special, like just ridiculous. So at any rate, that's affecting construction. They're not, uh, and, and uh, that's going to further add to that situation. So when it, uh, that situation being a, a lack of supply. Uh, which will put upper pressure on prices. So the conclusions, we've had a, got a lot of validation of a real estate cycle formula. We're expecting that long, modest expansionary period, but after this softening now through 2023, 2024, based on all of those 30 things, not the headline interest rates, et cetera, but rather those 30 um, different indicators, there's enough strength underneath everything that's really buoying it up the rents and the property prices. Now, of course, anything could change at any time if some policy or politician or lawmaker does something else. And so that's really where it's like, in some ways, proceed with caution, like, you know, be smart, make sure that if you are buying, you're buying for cash flow, you know, you're, you're, you're feeling if your mental stability and your mindset is absolutely crucial. So like, while these, I might say buy and hold, it's like, these are buy signals, they're hold signals when you've got the, the inner strength as well to like, just not be a part of this, uh, not, not fall into the trap of the fear basically, um, but be very, very well aware right now that there's gonna be confidence crushing headlines. And that's where that meds mindset really comes into play. Um, and we are expecting, you know, there's the crashing housing prices, we're expecting headlines like downward revisions and hiking interest rates and affordability and foreclosures and risk, 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 scare, 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 scare. So expect that. Meanwhile, that inflation is putting upward pressure on your property. Like that, in not even withstanding the appreciation of a particular market, the lack of supply, the expanding population, and a number of other indicators that are putting that upward pressure on real estate. So there you go. Don't freak out. <laughs> so um, again, if you're trying to, I will put a little caution on rent to own and fix and flip, and I'm almost done this macro section, and then we're going to get into our market analysis. Um, if you're going to consider rent to own, fix and flip, and that includes a, B, a 
buy, renovate, rent of the burr, buy, renovate, rent, uh, and then refinance. If you're going to consider that, please, like at this time, because it's going to be going through a softening likely, and these um, macroeconomic indicators are showing that it might be more difficult. So I would caution against those just for really know your shit, know your stuff um, so that you're doing it really effectively. And again, I mentioned this the last time, but you see how like this indicator is this indicator. And this indicator actually is a leading indicator for that indicator, but a lagging indicator of this indicator. And they're like literally you know what, that song that we started off with with the dance was like perfect. It's all over the place. And I guess I come, it came up with the kids in the bathtub economic effect. I mean, and uh, dad, I don't know if you saw this picture, but you might remember it. <laughs> that's me and my brother in the bathtub. And that's what's going on. You've got a whole bunch of economic indicators, leading lagging indicators of all kinds in a bathtub together. And they're just sloshing water out of the tub and whichever kid ends up tiring out first is where we'll start to be able to see what's going to settle down and what's actually going to come um, because there's a lot of noise so um, highly highly intelligent kids in the bathtub economic effect and um, stick with us um, we're going to be right back here next month for sure um, so I'm going to just ha hand this over to Paige for a moment, our head of customer um, experience, and she's just going to share a couple of things. Give me a moment to breathe, and I am also just share for others who um, may be on their trial um, with the Real Estate Wealth Lab. If you are, welcome, and Paige is just going to welcome you and show you what's going on. Thank you, Jennifer. I think we all should take a big breath after that. That was a lot of information. Um, it's nice to see so many of you here today. Um, if you are new to the Real Estate Wealth Lab, I wanted to make sure that you know we've got an excellent beginner's program. If you don't know where to stop, or sorry, not where to stop, where to start, we are offering a coaching program to help you buy either your first or second property. If you're experienced and you're looking to go from two to three properties, We've got the team in place to help you with the resources and the next steps to grow your portfolio. And if you've got years experience and you've got a big portfolio, we've got our next level access, which allows you to share some of your deals. We have our community lab mastermind group that uh, started the formation last Wednesday. And in August, we'll have part two of the mastermind formation. And we also have a video we'd like to share with you. Thank you. So if you saw that little preview, we've got our intelligence report that we send out weekly to make sure that you are kept in the know. This is Naran and Wendy who are leading our real estate investing starters guide with coaching. This has been going on for a few weeks and I see a few of you in here. Hello, I hope you're enjoying it. And uh, we've got a few weeks left and you're welcome to join us for that. I'm gonna have uh, someone else pop the link into the chat. So if you'd like to join the Beginners with Coaching, our intermediate experience level or our next level membership, please do so. Our next level membership does come with two weeks free. Uh, these members are invited to our Market Leaders Lab, as Jennifer mentioned, the second Wednesday of the month. We've got a wonderful guest coming up. Our community lab event is the third Wednesday of every month where we'll be doing part two of our mastermind community lab. And then this one, many of your favorites, the research lab is the fourth Wednesday of every month. And I'll add on to just one little bit. If you guys do have any questions, 
feel free to email us info at realestatewealthlab.com or you can visit us at the realestatewealthlab.com. Awesome. Thanks, Paige. And Thank yeah, I, I really appreciate that and giving everyone a little sort of what we've got going on. So thanks for that. Really appreciate it. Um, are you guys ready for uh, market analysis? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um, what I want to do is, um, so I'm going to go through them fairly quickly because not it doesn't appeal to everybody, but I, you, if you're new also, you're going to be getting a really good sense of what you need to do for your diligence and all of the pieces that go and in the order. So yeah, Moran, okay, you're excited. Woohoo. All right. So buckle up. Um, this is very, very, very robust. And you're going to start to see even more like we're pumping out some research and I'm really excited about it. Um, but I wanted to mention this. That's it. So at the end, um, I'd love to open up the lines for Q&A. Um, and if you guys want to hang out and chat, I might go and get my teacup, Jan, and um, we can have a little chat. So if that feels like something that would appeal to you, you can pop it in the chat or just hang out to the very end and we'll open it up um, and have our microphone. So um, I see people already sipping wine, so that might be fun. Okay, so our market analysis, these are some of the markets that we've already covered and uh, we're just getting started. Uh, we only launched in January, like this is so we're going for it. And today you're going to get some more. We, like I said, we look at 30 additional um, indicators, 30 weighted indicators. Um, and then when we're actually comparing, I look at hundreds, like if I'm doing a full comparison, but we're talking about the real estate cycle formula and where it is in the cycle. And then also um, that really transpires to a little, little symbol of you are here and then what do you do about it? <laughs> so we're going to get to that for each of these markets. And then you can decide if there's something that you want to invest in or not. Or if you are currently there, you've got some data, you can talk to your joint venture partners or raise capital with this thorough, thorough data. So um, again, we plop it on if it's going up, if it's da -da -da, so how long is it going to? And you're going to see that a lot of these indicators are still just slide up, slide up, slide up, slide up. And what that means is it projects out the rental properties market and the property market even further into the future. Now, if it were straight up like this, Ooh, we'd see it happen really quickly, a lot faster, but it wouldn't last as long. It would have a likelihood of going down. So this is actually really stable, good stuff. So we're going to go to Cincinnati. <laughs> I used to live in Michigan. I have been to Cleveland, Ohio, uh, Six Flags, uh, amazing. Um, Cleveland is not on here, and I will talk a little bit about that because I did do some analysis there. Um, so what we're going to look at is a GDP, and we're going to look at the nation and the state. Um, and then we always, always look at the city as well. And um, I do have some of the city data, so, um, but it's a little bit later. So the nation. So first of all, US GDP growth, 2021, 5.7. Ohio is 4.3. Um, the Q uh, quarter over quarter, we didn't like that one, minus 1. 1.6. Ohio is 1.8. 1. 1. So you can see less than uh, is less favorable. So I'm sorry, I think that might be, I meant great, well, it's technically less than, yes. So 1.8 minus 1.8 is worse than one minus 1. 1.6. So that's Ohio, that's not, that's not ideal, but it's a small amount and we're still looking at, uh, you know, the 2022 forecast is still pretty good, but the GDP also decreased in 46 states. So that means that there's some states that it didn't decrease in. So we'd want to be looking there. Um, and that includes Ohio. So here we are when we get into Ohio specifically. Um, it's 2021. It was 4.3%. 2022 Q1 minus 1.8. But guess what? We still look at the net. So I know that that's a quarter to a, a year. So you can't like, that's not apples to apples. But this is all the data that's available at the moment. So it's still a positive trend. Uh, and uh, and that net, and we want to be looking at net positive growth. So there's like a little bit of like a little bit of a declining growth rate. We don't know one quarter is not a trend. It's not apples to apples. It's too early. So there's oh, have you noticed the thumbs up or thumbs down? So this is a little. There's a little bit of positive news. There's a little bit of negative news. So it's like okay, um, because not all arrow signs. Like if it goes up, that it might be an inverse relationship. So we're trying to make it easier, more visually appealing, and easier to see that okay, there's some mixed signals here in the GDP growth for the state of Ohio. Now, when it comes to Cincinnati, 
here's the data. Um, we 2019 was a record high for Cincinnati. Like that's amazing. The upward trend is awesome. I, I played with this particular graph and like showed the actual trend. 2020, obviously everything was down. Um, so there's some quite quite a bit of interesting things to look at for Cincinnati. Um, what I would do if I were to dive deeper into this, if I were considering um, in, uh, investing in Cincinnati, 100% you have to do the next level of performing further assessment on the GDP. Um, I, I would really dig in and actually um, apply the proxy measures that I've created. So if you want them, I can send them your way uh, just to get another layer of what's going on and definitely looking into their economic diversity, et cetera. I mean, we're doing a lot of uh, a lot of this research, but want to I would dive a little bit deeper. So that's my little little it's not a yellow flag per se, but it's like, OK, things are looking pretty good. But I would want to know that market, what's driving it way further. Um, if I were to invest there. So that's all good news. Um, so again, we've now we've got little arrow on there and it's doing okay, not huge, not down. It's still on an upward progress and that's good for real estate. Um, <clears throat> jobs. So here's what we've got for um, the employment trends at a glance. Um, so this is Ohio, the labor force is up, the employment is up, the un unemployment is down and the unemployment rate is flat month over month, but trending down over the longer term. So these are all very, very good. You do want to be looking for that longer trend, not necessarily the month over month. And all of these indicators in terms of employment for Ohio look like, is that a big thumbs up? That's a pretty big thumbs up. I don't know if size matters, but maybe it does. So there we are. Uh, sorry, that was for Ohio. Yeah. And now we're doing the same thing for the Cincinnati. So now something to, to note is that when you're looking at data, sometimes it's it's at the city level, sometimes it's at the county level, sometimes it's at the uh, metropolitan metro area, uh, and sometimes it's at a census metropolis area. So it's uh, all, all very different there. So you just make sure that you're kind of like, you know, getting a broad sense of what data you're actually comparing to. But anyway, so Cincinnati, this Middletown, Ohio, this area, um, the labor force up, employment up, employment, unemployment down, and unemployment rate is flat. So again, these are all very strong sig signals, not just for the state, but also for Cincinnati itself. And so that's very, very good news in terms of that. So then we look at the unemployment rate specifically and compare to that one um, for the nation, US, state, Ohio, and this is the city of Cincinnati in May, but the other data is June. But so it, it would be even likely even better. But look at that. So Ohio is worse than um, in terms of unemployment rate. You want a lower unemployment rate. So Ohio is worse than the U uh, the nation. But Cincinnati is better than both. So that is very very good. I'm um, having that less is way more favorable. So way to go, Cincinnati. Um, uh, uh, and then here we are. We've got some uh, recent news articles that are saying that Ohio unemployment rates. Um, Employment is near all time low as recession worries climb. So that's, that's good news that would be protecting it in terms of its um, employment. And then again, just showing it a little bit more at that Ohio levels, May 3.9, June 3.9. This is all time low. And in fact, for the state, it's the lowest rate since May 2019. So this is all good news. Um, and again, these are signals like by Hold signals, um, but you want to make sure you've got enough of them to make it uh, make it uh, something that's valuable to you. So Ohio, the household incomes grow, um, but uh, they're growing less than the national average. And so this, is, I think, is very, very helpful in my humble opinion. Uh, you go back to where the data is available, but this is so for 2020. Now, we all know what happened in 2020, so just always keep that <laughs> in the back of your minds. But uh, so the U.S. is at 64, well, 65,000, Ohio, 58,000, and Cincinnati, the county, the Hamilton County where Cincinnati's in, is 59,000. So it's more favorable than the state, but it's lower than the national. So again, if you're in the state of Ohio, Oahu, <laughs> I meant Ohio. <laughs> anyway, Oahu is here in Hawaii. Um, so if you are doing that, then you want to make sure that you've got this sort of like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm in Ohio, I'm investing there. Cincinnati has better income. That's a good, that's a good thumbs up. Whereas if you're considering, oh, should I do Ohio the state or should I try and find maybe a different state with higher median income? 
then you might want to use that information to look at that. And the percentage change, holy crap, this one gets really cool. The nation, 7% change from 2016 to 2020. Ohio, 4%, not so great. But freaking Cincinnati, 21% increase. That's good. That you, that's, there, there's something that worth diving into in terms of their economy, jobs, whatever. So that's excellent news. Dub, uh, thumbs up. So their jobs also, when you plot them, they're going up. When we look at people, um, the population in Ohio um, is uh, around 11 million or so. And you can see the trend over time um, that it's, you know, it's, it's growing 0.8, you know, it's going okay. Cincinnati, similarly, um, it's Cincinnati's growth is less favorable than the state, but um, it's still positive growth. So that's okay. We're not too concerned about the negative growth in 2021 with all the imposed restrictions and things like that. I wouldn't be too worried about it, um, but it's not huge growth though. So this is where you'd wanna take the Ohio growth and the city growth and then start comparing it to other cities. Um, and we're gonna be doing that when we see Tampa a little bit and some of these other ones. And Tampa was actually surprising. So really, again, we're in a way that you can really see it, United States 0.38, Oh, this is for 2022, Ohio 0.22, Cincinnati is 0.4. So it's actually better than the nation and better than the state. And that's good news. It's not great, it's not huge, but it is better than, and that is a thumbs up. So, hey, cool, we plot that on here as well. Then inflation, yeah, you want to look at inflation now, hey? Uh, so what's going on in Ohio? Um, so the US is 9.1, Ohio is 8.6. So it's a little bit less. So it's your call though, if you think inflation is helpful or a hindrance um, at this time. So, um, but it's good information to have, but what you need to know an absolute nugget is that it means that things will be more expensive, but Ohio might be a little bit cheaper. It also means that real estate won't necessarily, necessarily appreciate with the inflation, just it, but it might still appreciate for the market. So there you go, because there's a two different appreciations. One is the market appreciation, the other is the inflation appreciation. Um, so pop that on there, inflation is going up, rental market. Now rents, again, rents and property prices are lagging indicators. And because they're lagging, they're not necessarily buy or hold signals. You really wanna only apply buy and hold signals or avoid signals or all of those signals to the ones that are leading indicators. Because again, these are just responding. This data, this rent data is responding to shit that my gosh, is responding to stuff that happened last year. <laughs> and as a result, that's, it's, it's just information. It's just good to know. So um, rents, however, while they're up year over year across the board, pretty much, they're not increasing as much as other states. Um, they also have some of the cheapest rental markets in the US, which could be great, or it could be something to avoid depending on the you know, what you're looking to accomplish in your real estate. It's really a personal choice and that's where you've got to get a good plan. When it comes to vacancy rates, um, 2006 vacancy peaked at 10.68%. Uh, 2022, it's fallen by 6% down to 4.67%. And you you want to have like a lower number is a, is a thumbs up on this. So this is good. It's improving. That said, 4.67 is a, it's still a fairly high um, high vacancy rate. And then when we drill down into Cincinnati itself, the Hamilton County, I should say, it's up at 9% vacancy. So I'd be a little you know, concerned about that. Ohio looks kind of pretty good. It's better than the nation, but Cincinnati, you know, it's, uh, it's at 9%. It's trending down, which is good news, but it's pretty high. So you'd want to do your diligence. That may be something that where you dive into like neighborhood specific information, getting to know that that area really well. The property market, we're going to go through this really quickly. It's all summarized on one slide for you. So hopefully that this will be helpful for you with your clients if you want to use this data. So what we're looking at is, and you can see the thumbs down and up is overall, it's like they're just doing okay um, for June, um, for June 2021, June, June 2022. So year over year, that's good data to look at. The sales are down, the listings are up, the average sale price is up. That's all actually quite good news, quite frankly. Um, although sales down could be arguable. Um, and then median day, uh, days on market, it's just, um, it's, uh, it is going down and that thumb is in the wrong direction. I'll fix that before it goes up in the, in the member uh, portal. So it's gonna go up. Um, so that's, that's, good. that's good. Cincinnati, um, 
the sales are down and the average price is up. So again, these are these are actually good signals. Um, so where it comes to for Cincinnati is um, beginning of stabilization period. So I take all of that data and then I put it into, yes, another spreadsheet, a magical one that automatically kind of like pops it all in and tells us where we are in the real estate cycle formula and in real estate cycle formula, we are at the beginning of a stabilization period based on the actual indicators and where they are today. Now, again, anything can change it at any time, but what does that mean? Like, so what? So it means, I think we're gonna have a little softening just like everywhere else for a little while through 2024-ish, but overall the market indicators are really, like they're strong and it should be in for a long modest stabilization and expansionary period for a long time. There's a lot going on there. Um, so there's a couple of cautionary tales here, I would say, do's, don'ts, some cautions, if you will, for the Ohio and the particularly Cincinnati markets. As again, we're going through that softening now through 23, 24. So you wanna be exercising extreme caution on rent to own fix and flips and burrs. Um, but normally under these circumstances, this is a great time to buy and hold. For the long term, rent to own can be okay, agreements for sales, options for purchase, vendor take backs and foreclosures. So you've got that as your roadmap of what to do next. So Cincinnati is headed in the right direction. Um, compared to its peers, I thought that was really interesting is that it's attracting more population than a, a lot of other um, large cities like the Clevelands and the, you know, all those. Um, uh, Columbus, pardon me, um, that there it's it's it is outperforming. So it's outperforming. Yeah, as I mentioned, um, some of these others. Um, there are some big yellow flags um, in those leading indicators that you want to make sure that you dive into a little bit further. Um, and it's not set to outperform other cities in other states. So, you know, maybe you're attached to Ohio, maybe you're not, um, but it would be a fine spot for you to consider investing depending on your plan. Um, just be mindful. So there's the data and you can make your choices from there. So um, now we're gonna get into the market analysis for Tampa and then we're gonna open it up for questions. So GDP, Tampa, Florida. And this one I gotta tell you surprised me. So Ken and others, I hope you're watching. <laughs> okay, so the real GDP. So US 5.7, Florida 6.9% GDP growth. Like. Florida, that is a huge thumbs up. But what the heck is going on with Tampa at 0.4%? That is, that is not good. It is way, way, way low. It's far lower than the nation and the state. I mean, at least it's growth, but that's a little bit troublesome. Um, now that said, this is where data can get a little tricky. So you may want to consider doing additional research if this is a city or metro that you're interested in checking out because the metro area, and we'll, we'll, I'll show you some slides about it uh, in a minute. Maybe next time I'll include a, a map so you can actually see it. Um, at any rate, um, so when we're looking at this, we, we're seeing that there's like the metro area, which includes Clearwater and St. Pete. And St. Pete is actually a burgeoning location right now. Everyone's talking about St. Pete, St. Pete. They want to live in St. Pete. But there's no data for St. Pete. <laughs> but so you can't actually work it back and extrapolate it. So there could be some growth there, but it, it would require a little bit of hands-on boots on the ground. Good thing I know people there because they're moving there and um, people are moving to the area around it. So maybe it's just the city of Tampa um, that's kind of like, okay, people have moved out or there's like not as much economic activity in the city, but in the surrounding area. So you, again, it requires more research. Um, maybe maybe a trip to florida who wants to go to tampa and st pete with me how about that that would be fun yes thanks you okay right we should do that guys okay yeah uh, i like that idea okay all right so um us 3.6 for this 2022 forecasted gdp florida 4.7 tampa 0.4 again so it's actually flat um, in terms of, I'll, I'll move over here. So your percentage change is literally flat. It's not expected to grow. Um, I mean, it's still growth, but there's no net change like, oh, we're gonna grow even more. Nope. So that's uh, the positive news is that it's still growth, but it's flat growth rate. There's not signs of growth. Um, and definitely again, still similarly, I'd perform further um, assessment on this. 
and economic diversity. And I really was surprised by this data. I thought Tampa would be like a home run. Like, of course, it's Florida. It's hot. Everyone's moving there. I heard about it. All my friends are talking about St. Pete, blah, blah, blah. And this was really, yeah, quite, quite surprising, which I think is great. Do you know why? Because this is why we do the research. <laughs> because now we're armed with data. So um, I hope that this is helpful for you. Um, look at this. Tampa continues to struggle in economic competitiveness compared to other metro areas. It's just, uh, it just isn't holding up from its economic measures for job growth or local wages, household income, even education. So that's a cautionary sign for Tampa. Um, immigrants are crucial to Tampa's economy, say the local experts. So again, this was something that we would want to watch. Here we are, little glasses, that we would want to watch. Why would we want to watch it? Because as borders open, as immigrant, uh, immigration increases, um, if they go to Tampa, and, they're, and the Tampa economy is highly, um, uh, well, there's a lot of 30% of their businesses are owned by immigrants, for example, then this could be great at adding that entrepreneurial spirit, creating jobs, et cetera, et cetera. And that could be very important when it comes to uh, improving its economic diversity and growth. And did you know that the UK is the number one investor in Florida? I want to check that out. Very interesting. So when it comes to uh, GDP, mm, flat, that is a flat arrow, um, but it is growth remember so it might be flat but it's still 0.43 it's uh, flat net but it is still a uh, positive growth um although very low um okay so then jobs when we look at florida again like these are big thumbs up they look good um labor force is up employment is up unemployment is down unemployment rate is down month over month even if you're looking at the long-term trends which is what we want to be doing it's all moving in the right direction and those are good thumbs up. So now here we are. So now we've got Tampa, St. Petersburg, Clearwater, not just city of Tampa. So this is this is helpful uh, information in terms of what we're looking at. So the labor force is up, um, the employment is up, unemployment is down, and unemployment rate is down. And by the way, for those of you who are skeptical and wondering about participation rates, we did look at participation rates in depth in um, January. And all participation rates basically across the board have gone back up to pre pandemic levels like we're not there, those aren't shifting much so uh, participation rate and labor force numbers. So again, that brings us back to our conversation earlier about productivity and where that's gone, but uh, uh, in terms of these numbers they're still there so um, when it comes to Florida again near all time low unemployment rate it's fully recovered from the record unemployment that it had in June 2020 fully recovered. So that's very good. Now, when we look at that, at the, now we're at the city of Tampa. So the nation unemployment rate, 3.6, Florida, 2.8, Tampa's 2.4. So that's more favorable in terms of its unemployment rate. And that's a positive thing. When it comes to median household income, Tampa is less than the state of Florida, and the state of Florida is less than the national. Uh, so that's not great. I mean, in terms of median household income, it's nice to see it growing, though. Um, but uh, it's 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 not. Um, and it's one well, I mean, sure with inflation, wage increases a little bit, but it's not where it needs to be compared to its peers. So again, it's among the lowest of its peers, um, peer cities in Florida. And then I was thinking, okay, so what would be contributing to that? So we don't know, you know, we'd want to get more into the economy and what's really going on there. But it also, Tampa is a huge place for retirees. So, whoa, let's switch gears entirely. Are you guys interested in senior living housing or assisted or like that kind of thing? There's some, I am, I know Terry is. Um, you know, that would be an amazing possibility. So I'd want to do some serious demographic research because that could be the fact um, of the matter there. So now let's get into the people. I didn't do a full demographic analysis, but you can see just in terms of pacing, Florida growth is, is good. It's um, doing all right. Tampa Metro. Um, so there's 2.8. Oh, size, size matters. And I do see that this slide needs to be updated. I see it's got something wrong on it. So I apologize for that. I had a little computer glitches um, right before I was getting on. So I will change that. This Florida population is not 2 million. I know it's in the 20 millions. Um, and I don't know what happened there. So I apologize, but 
I'll make sure that that's fixed. Um, maybe a little some little gremlin got into my computer. Hey, Paige saw that too, <laughs> um, right as I was getting started today. So. Um, a, uh, regardless, Tampa Metro, 2.8 million is great. Population is good. Florida's in the 20 millions. It's growing. Um, so it's a decreasing pace of growth, but it's still increasing and it's increasing by quite a bit. Remember, like 1.17 is is way higher than what was it in like Cincinnati, like 0. 0. 0.4 for Ohio and 0. 0.8 for Cincinnati. That's a big difference. Um, so Tampa City itself, not the metro, see now we're at the city, is 1.26, that's from 2020, but it's had 2.56 growth since 2021. So those are all pretty like solid thumbs up. It's a little bit less like, look at the US is growing at a rate of 0.38, where are those people going? They are going to Florida, and a good number of them are also going to Tampa. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is powerful. This is where the little cautionary orange yellow flags may come off because population, people drive innovation, they drive jobs, they drive economic activity. And as you know, we're dealing with the great refuge and the great uh, migration and people moving and then figuring it out. So this is quite a strong case for Tampa and definitely for Florida. Uh, inflation in Tampa, um, I couldn't find it for Florida for whatever reason, but uh, for the US it's 9.1, Tampa is 11.3. So again, your call if you think that that's beneficial or not, it will be more expensive than elsewhere. Okay, and then, um, yeah, that's where we are plotting it on, on the, the the chart here and the formula, politics, the, the political climate and the taxes. So the political climate in Florida is outstanding for the economy at the moment based on the, that kind of level. We've talked about that before, so I'm not going to go into it in details now, but something that you need to know about that uh, Tampa is raising property taxes and mill rates, etc. So um, that is just something that you need to be aware of. And then I was thinking about this. So when property taxes, have they ever been dropped. Never heard of taxes going down. <laughs> so this trend is always that they're going to go up, but I guess you want to be mindful of how often do they go up? What's the climate inside um, inside the government? So the rental market, again, these are lagging indicators from rents are responding to indicators from basically last year. Um, and so you'll see that from 2021 to 2022 for Florida, like they didn't go up that much, which might sound like just bizarre given like what we've what we've been encountering. But it's interesting because you want to pick your market well for hotspots. What this indicates, because we've looked at like some of the hotspots like Orlando and Fort Lauderdale, and they've been having like, and we'll go through it in a second, like you know, 20 plus percent growth, but for Florida, that means that there's some that aren't, that there are not growing, according to this data from rentdata.org and depth of numbers. So very interesting, something to watch out for. But when we look at Tampa, July, the median um, the, and the year over year increase, this is median, not average, it is way above both the nation and the state from a rental perspective. So what does that mean? It means that people are moving there and demanding like they want to be in Tampa. And that speaks to populations moving in and wanting a place to rent. One point, remember, it was like one of the highest um, in influxes in terms of population growth. And so they need a place to stay. Um, so Tampa rents surge. So here we are, rents have risen in all four markets in that area, um, St. Petersburg, people are moving there. So the economy should come because this is the year to innovate against inflation also. So even bigger change than expected from 24 to 35%, 30, 32%. And in a typical year, rents swing by about one to 2%. So this is massive changes there. Um, when it looks, we're looking at vacancy rates now at Florida, um, the US vacancy rate, 5.97, Florida, 8.72%. The last available uh, data was from 2019. So the Florida um, vacancy rate is actually above the national average. When it comes to Tampa, um, a little bit of a longer trend that we're looking at, um, but it is falling over the longer uh, trend. It is, um, it's fallen to 8.18%, um, which is in better than the state. 
So that's good. It's better than the state, but it's still above the nation. Um, and then the vacancy rates, Tampa, St. Peter's. So this is the that collection of cities, the Tampa, St. Petersburg, and Clearwater area. So when we see that kind of data, vacancy rate, this is 2022 Q1, um, and it's greater than both. So it's a little bit less favorable. So that's not as great news. We don't like to see that necessarily. So what's changing? So you, these are where you see like little thumbs down. You'd want to go in and do some more research if this is something that you're looking at. Um, uh, investing in or if you're already investing in it, making sure you know your market. Uh, record spike in rents hits Tampa Bay after newcomers flocked to Florida during the pandemic. This is all pretty abnormal. And uh, what's most shocking, oh, I love this, this is by Ken H. Johnson, Associate um, um, Dean of Florida Atlantic University's College of Business. This is all pretty abnormal. And what's most shocking to me is the magnitude of differences in the numbers. And that is indeed, that sums it up. I mean, to see those rents at like in the double digits and in the 20s, it's really pretty wild. Now we're moving into the property market. Um, and the property market um, is just summarized very quickly. We're just looking at data from, this was the most recent available um, at the time of being able to pull this together from the Tampa Realtors. So May, 2021. May 2022, the percentage change, sales up 20, listings, the new listings up 3.2%, active up 11, average sale prices up, median sale price up, and days on market is down. And that's all indicating that the market is responding to, again, stuff from two years ago, and it's still, it's actually still going up. So what is the driving factor there? When you look at all of the data, the driving factor is a population increase. And where people go, they put upward pressure on rents and property prices, and then they create economic activity. So investors are buying um, fewer homes in Tampa. And here's what that means for home buyers. So investors are buying, this is, investors are buying fewer homes in Tampa. Well, we want to know why. Absolutely, what's going on there? And what's happening is I think the people are actually moving there to live there in that Clearwater, St. Petersburg, Tampa area. And maybe it's a little bit less of an investor hotbed. So as we put all of that into the real estate cycle formula, we actually come out with the you are here and it's actually at the end of stabilization. And at the end of stabilization, these are some things that you normally do, buy and hold. You can fix and flip. Um, you can uh, uh, burr, but again, because of what's going on right now, got those asterisks there. This is definitely like, you know, times to be cautious, um, given that these macroeconomic factors are, are really indicating a softening now through 23, 24. Um, but, you know, so I would, I would uh, exercise caution on those. And in conclusion, Tampa is attracting people and that's pushing up rents and that's pushing up properties and that is going to significantly like people when they move someplace they got to work they got to eat they got to feed themselves they're going to create jobs they're going to create economic activity this could be a really cool opportunity to get in now as that economic activity comes and then pushes prices even higher that's an absolute possibility. Um, so Tampa's leading indicators, however, do not outperform many of its peers in Florida, such as Orlando. So that's something to consider. But then there's really good surf. It's, it's a really nice beach. So you might want to consider that. Um, there are major trends, like I said, um, people are, are moving there and that might really offset that slower GDP. Um, it's a trendy spot. There's revitalization. People are going there. And like I said, where people go, money follows. And um, that puts more upward pressure on rents and property markets. So ladies and gentlemen, that is the conclusion. And on the conclusion of all of this, and I'll stop sharing my screen in just a moment, is that home prices really have nowhere to go but up on top of supply and demand issues, inflation and other indicators, they're poised to put more upper pressure on real estate. Not a lot of pressure, but pressure over time. Um, and yes, you're gonna hear things like interest rates are gonna make, like change all this stuff. The fundamentals, like you just witnessed, like there's still growth, there's still growth in all of those fundamentals. So the formula indicates that it should definitely uh, uh, carry on. So um, <laughs> these are options right now, buy, hold, almost anywhere, as long as it's cash flowing, as long as you've got the right mindset, as long as you're feeling like comfortable, there's a huge opportunity uh, to be in the market. And, and, you know, there's an old saying of like, don't time 
don't time the market, just get in. Basically, don't, don't try to time the market, just be in the market and wait it out. And if you can wait it out, then, and you know that real estate investment has there in traditionally been an incredible investment over the long term then that's, uh, there's real opportunity there. So you've seen this many times. Um, please tell your friends, uh, come and join us because if you want more of this analysis, by the way, I just, I, I'm not allowed to tell you because Ken told me I couldn't and he's got samurai swords, so I'm not, but we've got some pretty cool things coming up. And I wanted to show you, we've done some research reports like this in the past. Um, there's more to come. And remember, we're summarizing the, the news and headlines for you. Um, you should have gotten yours or you'll get it today for your, for your news um, uh, already. And we've got lots that we want to hang out with you. So please share with your friends and come and hang out with us. And a big, huge, I'm going to say thank you. I know that was a lot, but uh, as always, I appreciate your attention. And I'm going to stop sharing. And feel free to like have just an open chat um, if you have any questions or pop them in the chat. Oh, Catherine, I wonder if participation rates have been affected or altered by people who do not participate in mandates. Yeah, that would be a real deep dive. That's an interesting question. They would have had to have changed the methodology. I mean, they might have. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Any questions? Any thoughts on core inflation coming down over the last four months? Um, and what do you mean by that, Elias? Hmm. I'd have to look into that. I don't know. Does anyone else know? Oh, thank you. It excludes energy and food. Yeah. Um, Okay. What do I think about that? So when it comes to, okay, so I don't buy really any of the, the CPI, the core inflations, et cetera, like for them to say that it's going, if you're, if, if I'm reading this correctly, if core inflation is showing that it's coming down over the last four months, which excludes energy and food, I don't buy that at all. Um, the, all of those index, indexes, in my humble opinion, um, need some updating and then actually and so does employment data quite frankly i've been saying this for probably six years um is that they need an overhaul of the methodology they're not accurately grabbing the right information and that's what i was kind of trying to make light with i guess in some ways with the case study of the coat hanger is that like yeah they might have all these like fancy metrics but at the end of the day if my coat hanger costs me 30 percent more or if you know my lamp or my light or whatever and my life costs me 30 percent more then that is really what we need to be planning for and experiencing so that's my thought elias i hope that that helps um, um oh all right i see somebody's got to go thank you very much um okay and then the conversation here is about data and research love it thank you danielle yes this is definitely it's just it's it's data so that you are armed with the right information and you're not out there listening to weird weird headlines I can tell you right now and I, I do um, my heart goes out to people right now there's a lot of confusion out there and a lot of fear it's a lot of fear but like look at all of those data points that I just showed for Canada US uh, all like the Ohio's and the, the metros and the cities and all these like fundamentals that are, they're, they're growing, they're growing, even despite all of this. And yes, we do expect some softening for sure, because it has to with inflation, we're going to see a bit of a recession, we're going to see a downward, you know, economic trend, but it doesn't need to be like so massive. It, because it's also based on some good fundamentals. Um, Danielle, Tampa seems like a great place to invest. It, it does, that GDP is really low. So you'd wanna check out the Metro and understand their economy. But with that many people moving there, and a little sun and surf, uh, it does look like it's got some solid fundamentals for sure. Um, Julius, um, are you planning to dive into other cities in Hawaii? We certainly can. Um, one thing that I, I really, I don't, when I came across the Cleveland uh, population data, I was a little, it was alarming. And in fact, that was the head, like 
wasn't the headline, but like that was one of the ways that it was characterized. Um, so I would please, if you're thinking about Cleveland, check into their population. It sounds like it's a pretty significant negative uh, number that people are moving out. Um, so consider that. Um, real estate market driver, net, slow positive growth. Exactly. You don't want massive growth. It, like, in fact, massive growth means that there's going to be massive decline. That's usually how those cycles work because those are business cycles. And our real estate cycle, you actually just want not a lot, like just do, 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 nice going along growth. So perfect. Thank you, Nick. It was a good way to characterize it. Um, Julius, yes. Okay, you looked into the population too. Well, I'll be interested to see what you saw on Cleveland. And I did not research it. I just came across things as researching for um, Cincinnati. So, and the plan to answer your question a different way, Julius, is our plan. is so we're just getting started with market research. <laughs> like, I mean, we're what, six months? Old. Hey, have we had our birthday? I guess we're six months old now from our official launch. Hey. So imagine, I think we've done what, 20 some odd cities in six months and we are just getting ramped up. Um, so, you know, we'll, the answer is a definite yes. And even more frequently, ah, I'm excited. Like what we're working on in the background is pretty epic. So yay, stick with us, bring your friends so that we can put more resources towards it and it'll be done even faster. How about that? <laughs> so we'll get that to you. Um, Nick is saying real estate influencer, massive interest slam on the economy. If we overlap real estate influencers on top of market drivers, don't you see a substantial decline in the next 18 months? Yeah, okay. So I, what you're saying is this interest rate could really impact and actually have a soft, like a, a significant softening. And I do see that as a possibility. I believe that because inflation is runway, runaway inflation, I believe that there's some challenges coming ahead. There will be a recession. How it can be mitigated, the best ways through innovation, but the, the ways that governments, the only ways that I know that you can actually influence inflation is by um, stopping to print, like stopping the whole money printing thing and raising interest rates. And like I said, um, Nick, like, in theory, in order to actually do something about inflation, interest rates have to be double digit right now. If interest rates are, sorry, if inflation's like eight, nine, whatever, then they need to be at like 10, 11%. That's not a good, right, the solution to inflation is a recession. And that's what I'm saying. And that's 100% why I'm showing a softening. How hard it will be, this recession that's coming, because it's the only response. It's the only, it's not even the response, pardon me. It's a side effect of the responses to an inflation. So even, get this, this is really important. Even if they do nothing, they being the government, even if they literally do nothing, the answer always, for the answer or the side effect of inflation is always a recession. So that, that and I have definitely been mentioning that it's just a matter of how much of a recession is it going to be how deep is it going to go um and that data is still like the jury and I've mentioned this earlier I feel that the jury is still out um I think that we need to be very mindful I'm watching it but I don't know that it's going to be uh I don't know yet I really and I don't even want to say like oh it's going to be deep or not because I don't know it's your point about it being like a market influencer. It's like, I don't know what these politicians are doing right now. Um, I really don't. And that's why I don't even want that to, to suggest that I'm inside their heads in any way, shape or form. So we want to, I want to watch it. That's why we've got our weekly newsletters for sure. Um, Catherine saying, I think, does that answer? And is it possible to unmute? Like do people, or are you having to, I'm concerned, Nick. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I am concerned also. Absolutely. And that's where I recommend that we, um, that if we are buying right now, that you are buying with cash flow, that you're doing it in really smart. And that's where I, I've got caution flags and a little bit more like hold kind of signals um, because inflation, they're, because they're also not modeling inflation. Like the Bank of Canada is still saying, oh, it's higher than we expected. Like, how is that even possible? So do I trust their logic? Do I trust their responses? Like, quite frankly, I hope I don't, is, if this goes live, I hope I don't get censored out there on the internet, whatever. Um, but, um, 
it, it's just, it's, it's fascinating. And so as a result, I'm definitely concerned about that. And they should have known that when they printed the money back in 2020 and circulated it, like that we were going to experience inflation. So they could have started rising interest rates back then. I know weird, but we didn't need that much stimulus. What we needed anyways, I could digress. <clears throat> so, but we're here now. Um, okay, great. So participants, hey, if you're, you can actually unmute them yourself. So if you do want to, you can talk. Like, I'm happy to have a combo and hear your voices. Um, okay, so Catherine, I think I will see the fear trickle down to Cabo San Lucas in the coming months when Americans sell off their vacation homes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, dropping the whole currency and going digital only, a bit worried about that. Uh-huh, yep. Yeah, there's a lot to be concerned about. What are some of your biggest fears? And let's make sure that we address them. That would be helpful. And then I can research them a little bit further if you like. I mean, Nick, you said that you're concerned. Tell me more. And Hugh, people paying too much attention to the mainstream media. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing too why I mentioned earlier in the in this particular presentation also is this concept of I'm going to use the word self fulfilling prophecy in some ways. There's fear in the media and then we're bringing in the fear and then guess what propagates or a, a, a recession also is market confidence market confidence leads to a recession so it's like it's we are it's and you know I hate even the word recession because even now just the darn headlines like debating the damn word <laughs> no like let's like use our compassion for just a second and a recession means that people lose their jobs and that friggin sucks that sucks so i i just i want to make sure that we're couching it in in that like humane way um and be prepared to help people out and be prepared to you know in my in my opinion, this is when also I also talk a lot about um, uh, preferential uh, property types, um, and those are, are and actually when you're looking at your properties, you don't want to have micro suites. You want to have ideally two bedrooms. Why? Because when people lose their jobs or times are hard, they get roommates, and if they can have a roommate, then that helps offset things. And people like you know live together and things like that. So. Um, on a positive note, Hugh says, people always need a place to live and we can help. Exactly. And, and, and that's the hundred percent and being humane and providing good, um, good houses to good people, you know, and, and really being like, we've been a lot of us been doing real estate for a long time. And some of us are just getting started and it doesn't matter where you are you can still be a good rental housing provider. And you can also set yourself up for success. You know, like there's lots of planning. Um, I have, I have, and I've been doing this myself um, since actually the beginning of the pandemic, but I, I, I brought it out I, and I've created a, uh, and you probably all have it in me. You guys, some of you are like serious business folks. So that's great. But if you don't have it already, there's a cash flow modeling um, spreadsheet that I created that I use myself. And there's a couple of like, it's just normal cash flow, like what's coming in, what's going out so that you can see like, okay, how, how are my properties doing? How's my business is doing? How's whatever doing? But in it, I created a little spot where you're able to model it. So for example, if your vacancies go down or if you, you know, something like a tenant, whatever you've got, some, you can actually see, okay, maybe this property isn't performing, but this property is or whatever have you. And then they kind of offset each other. So it gives you your whole, um, your whole portfolio, if you will. Um, Catherine, Canada is now advertising. So what I should fin fin finish that. If you want that spreadsheet, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get it to you. Okay. Um, Canada is now advertising being able to move to Canada in 10 days and being able to work. Wow. That's interesting. I did, um, I recall, well, this spring at some point anyway, um, that uh, it was really cool. Canada was doing like major advertising um, abroad and they even, it was really neat. I've never seen this before, but they actually put their Canada advertising, like move to Canada, get a job, whatever in pigeon 
I was, I've, I've actually never seen pigeon written down and it was so cool. And it's like, yeah, that's awesome. Like they're advertising and that's something that Canada does need is to increase its immigration and it's got targets and those are massive targets. And remember when it comes to real estate is that people need a place to live like he was saying and that when immigrants come to Canada, this is Canada in particular, a little bit different in the US. I don't have the data for it, although it's probably similar because it's pretty normal. When you move to a new place, you rent. You rent for a while, you get the feel of it, and then you buy. And immigrants typically, when they arrive in Canada, 70% arrive with a down payment, and uh, approximately 70% arrive with a down payment, and then three years after renting, they buy. And this is one of the reasons why the 2023, 2024 hypothesis of going down is sharper. So Nick, back to your question about like, oh, you know, is it gonna be a recession? Yeah, there's gonna be a recession, but there's also gonna be an impact on property prices. And I've been saying this for almost a year now, because the borders were closed in 2020 and 2021. I know they say that they brought it, and I'm talking about Canada right now, but they say they brought in, um, you know, all the people, but they did not. They just reprocessed them as permanent residents. Um, something similar will happen in the US, but I don't have the exact timelines. But here's what happened. In 2019, we had the highest immigration uh, on record. 2018, we had super high immigration. 2017, we had high immigration. Okay, so 2017, remember I just said they take three years to buy a house. Guess what happened in 2020? Housing prices went through the roof. 2021, housing prices went through the roof. So in 2019, theoretically this year, 2022, some of this demand of reducing the softening is, is theoretically based on immigrants who arrived in 2019. So that means 2023 and 2024, because in 2020, there was no, nobody went anywhere. Nobody came into Canada. There was no immigration. That's 400,000 less people who would have been approximately, who would have been buying a house in 2023. That demand has evaporated. So we have to keep, also keep that in mind, like when, because we will be feeling it. Like there will be a softening next year and the year after, because also 2021, there was also no immigration, although they said it on paper, but if you dig behind, you know, all of that, we know that there wasn't. So therefore there will be a, like a, a lower, um, a softening, I guess, on, on property prices. And then theoretically, once we start to see, you know, immigration, we should be having immigration now, and then that'll help buoy it up for 2025, but we have yet to see it actually like fully materialize. So this could be um, something to be concerned about even a little bit longer. And at the moment, the fundamentals are still there, but yes, it, anything could happen at any moment. And this is why we have to be very, very um, on top of it. And you guys are like, you're, paying attention to this, you're coming out all the time, you're hanging out with us so that um, when something does change, you're going to be the one of the first to know and the first to be able to like, you know, understand it or assess it or analyze or bounce ideas off of each other. So Doug, good to see you. Um, okay, Danielle, we'll get you a spreadsheet. <laughs> Any, uh, anything else? I've been talking for a long time. I'm happy to have questions or Right. 